So I have taken the liberty of naming this webinar Women in Resistance Teaspoons of Gunpowder because it, it echoes, sorry for the pun, echoes and reflects, um, the new student podcasts that we have up that went up on January 27th. And I'm going to be using a little bit of one of the student podcasts, which is named Teaspoons of Gunpowder, coincidentally. And it's really like, as I was saying, and I'm going to get serious now, um, as I was saying, this is one of those stories that captured me from the minute that I heard it. And I think you'll see why in the course of uh, in the course of the in the course of the session. So um, just a couple of words about Echoes and Reflections. Welcome for all of the people who have been with us before on webinars and all of the newbies. You know that we are a joint program of three very heavy hitters in Holocaust education, those being the ADL, um, USC Shoah Foundation, and Yad Vashem, which is Israel's uh, official Holocaust Remembrance Center. Um, we have reached more than 125,000 educators across the United States, um, and we basically target American middle and high school teachers. We have great resources. We do everything for you. Everything is dynamic. We've got webinars. We've got continuing education. We've got online courses. We've got, of course, our core, which is um, our 12 units each of which has three to four complete um, fleshed out lesson plans in them. So we'll be looking a little bit about the website also. And I would be remiss if I did not show you our pedagogical principles, which there are some facilitators who call them the North Star, others who call them the backbone of our program. But these are the principles by which we live. Um, and we strongly believe in them for Holocaust education. You will see that the ones that I'm going to be using tonight uh, very, very much teach the human story, very much primary source materials. Um, and I think also very much foster empathy. Um, and you'll see, you'll see where all of that comes up. Um, so let's get in. Some echoes and reflections on resistance. Before we really even launch into a story like this, I want to talk to you a little bit about the concept of resistance because the big question is, what messages do you want your students to take away from your Holocaust teaching? And feel free, you guys, um, I'm going to open my chat if you want to talk to me uh, right now about this specific question. What messages do you want your students to take away when you teach the Holocaust? Think about that for a second. Sharon says hate is never good. Sharon, I completely agree with you. That's, that's always a good one. Um, empathy, Cameron says. Hi, Cameron. Great. Tessa says, hate starts out small. Absolutely, Tiffany, that people can make a difference in fighting hate. I agree with everything so far. Paul, oh my goodness. It was um, never again begins in the classroom. Power in the actions of one. I love it. How to be an upstander. Be aware. Everyone has the ability to stand up for what is right. Um, beautiful beautiful to be aware of what they say and how to affect others when they go out into the world thanks tj how to be an upstander rather than a bystander um beautiful beautiful um angie it wasn't inevitable it was human actions okay so i'm going to close the chat up for a sec um and uh, and also get rid of these things again the floating meeting controls which i love now what i want you to think about is especially with a lecture like this okay i i completely believe in what you're saying Hate starts with small actions and they should believe in their power to challenge it. And, and all of that, you know, all of that stuff that we focus on the Holocaust writ large. But when you get into a situation like this, a story like the one that I'm going to tell you tonight, I think what I'm trying to say here is. The Holocaust, we teach a lot, a lot of times we teach about the Holocaust because it shows the depravity. It shows the lowest level that human beings can reach. But when you hear stories like this, it also shows the highs, the amazing things that human beings can do, the amazing resilience, the amazing resistance. And think about that because that's also a very important message for your kids to take away. They're all going to ask you, right? The number one question that students ask in the classroom is, why didn't the Jews resist? And you have to be ready with an answer. And the answer is always going to be, they did resist. But 
before you can understand how difficult it was to resist, it's important to understand what they were resisting. This is a picture from the Lodz ghetto right here, another one right here. Jews didn't have the right to live. And that's what they're resisting. This is um, suitcases at Auschwitz from one of the ex exhibits in that museum. Um, remember that Jews were targeted. Remember that Jews, again, did not have the right to exist. Once you were targeted as a Jew, you were going to be hunted. And that is what the Holocaust was all about. So how do you resist? What do you need in order to resist? Why should resistance be so difficult? Well, I'm going to I'm going to give you here Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you can see that most of the time even uh, the basic food, water, rest and security, those needs were not met in ghettos and camps. So if those needs were not met, how are you going to get even higher on the pyramid? to do other things? How are you going to think about resisting when you don't even have enough food to eat? How are you going to think about resisting when your parents or your children are, are don't have a place to sleep at night? It's going to be very difficult. So this is kind of my introduction because you have to keep all of this in mind to approach the subject of resistance at Auschwitz. We have to have a lot of modesty and a lot of humility because we will never be able to understand what the people there were going through. We will never be able to understand it, no matter how eloquently I describe it to you or how many photographs we look at or how many testimonies we listen to. We will never understand it because we were not there. So we have to be very humble and we have to be very modest. And we also have to approach this subject with a great deal of awe because for these people to do what they did is just is just mind boggling. That being said, let's just talk for a minute, a quick minute about survival in Auschwitz. Um, you all know that Auschwitz, and when I say Auschwitz, Auschwitz was a complex, right? Auschwitz was a complex of three major camps and as many as some people say, as many as 50 sub camps. So you have Auschwitz one, the, the Stammlager, the, the mother camp, uh, Auschwitz II was Birkenau, which is where this picture is taken. This is the famous ramp at Birkenau where people would come off the trains and be selected. Remember that Auschwitz is a, it's a death camp, but it's also a major labor camp. At any given moment in time at Birkenau, there were 100,000 prisoners. And all of these prisoners were performing work for the Germans, forced labor, slave labor for the Germans. So you get off the train Immediately, the men are separated from the women, and there is a process that we know as selection. And that's what you see going on here. In this selection process, there you're given a quick look up and down. People who can work for the German slave labor industries are going to be sent to one side, and people who are under 15, over 50, sick, pregnant, um, carrying children, those people are not fit for work. And so they serve no purpose for the Germans. They will be sent immediately to death. And that's what, what's happening in this selection process. Not that the people who are sent to forced labor are being sent to life. There are some people who would have you believe that one side was to life and one side was to death. Absolutely not. One side was to death and the other side was kind of a suspended death sentence. Because most people who were sent to Auschwitz, don't exist, don't live more than three months. And that's if you're not Jewish. If you're a Jewish prisoner, your life expectancy there is much shorter because you're beaten more often, you have a worse work assignment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just more pictures of deport, of the, sorry, the selection process going on. But those who weren't sent to immediate death, the ones who are going to be forced laborers, are going to undergo this process of dehumanization. And I want to show you some pictures. These are some women who have basically just gotten off, um, just disembarked from the train. And these are the women who have been selected to become slave laborers, by the way, in the background of this picture. Um, and all of these pictures are from the Auschwitz album. We have some Auschwitz album pictures in unit five, which is the final solution unit. You can see all of the things that they brought with them those big mountains of things in the background. Those are all of the things being cleaned out of the train by the 
um, by the Canada Commando, which is, you can see them working on the ramp in the back. Those are the people in the uniforms. So again, these are women who have been selected to work and you see that they are transformed and dehumanized into these women who have no hair, they have no undergarments, they have no names anymore, all they have are tattoos, um, they have numbers instead of names, and this is what they look like. Um, I'm going to skip this very long quote because I think it's more important for me to get to the story, and we can always come back to this later, but I did want to make a point of showing you what this dehumanization looked like, and here's a massive crowd of women again, pictures from the Auschwitz album. Um, so should we be asking, why didn't the Jews resist? Or shouldn't the question be, how were they able to resist in circumstances like this? How were they able to resist? And that's really what I want to look at. So this is, of course, the way our website looks. Um, we're going to go into the teach section. And in the lesson plans, we are going to be using the final solution yes lesson plan and the Jewish resistance lesson plan, because this is a uh, um, this is a story that really does impact on both. Um, and before we go any further, I'm going to jump out uh, just for the sake of um, the sake of convenience. Um, I want to jump out and I want to play this testimony for you by Itka, who is one of our faves. Um, if you've heard Itka, Itka is Itka has two testimonies in our final solution unit, and in this one, she is describing what life was like at Auschwitz. Again, just to make the point of how difficult it will be to resist. Okay, so here is Itka. I'd like to describe your day in Auschwitz. We would get up in the morning. To begin with, we slept and worked and wore the same clothes all the time. Every few months, they would disinfect. Every day, we had to be stay in the counter there. And they made it responsible. So if, let's say, one would want to run away. And if he had a heart, he said, how can I endanger all? Because then we would all suffer. You could sometimes stay for hours and for days. Dead or alive, everybody had to be accountable. After the appeal, we would always march in five. I zwei, drei, four, five links. I zwei, drei, four, still I hear it in my, and on both sides, the, the um, guards with dogs and marching. When you marched out, sometimes we never knew who would come back because sometimes at random there were selections at the, at the gate that they would take away. I remember there were instances where if one of us looked pale, the other would, sometimes I would do it to Bina, and say, Yitkolot, they still has a blast, you look so pale. And she would pinch my cheek to make her look red because first of all, they did everything to make us sick. Then they would, they didn't need an excuse. Then they would uh, take it out because you're sick. Just, it was not very much. Another thing which was the horrible thing, there was no, you couldn't go to relieve yourself. Then I understood why the balls. And then at work, carried the gravel or the stone from one place to the other. Sometimes they would mark us. And I remember they would point to the guest chamber, where is your guard now? And inside myself, I said, our guard is here, but where is yours? So you hear Itka. And you hear her very clearly talking about the humiliation, the abuse that she got. Um, and you understand the guards, the dogs, the beatings. If you remember um, the uh, all the testimony about arrival at Auschwitz that we have in, in Echoes and Reflections, the beating, the growling, the barking of dogs, the beating, the shooting, the hitting, um, the screaming, this is not a place, this is not a place that's anything like anything that we have ever known in our lives. Um, and, and when you listen to Itka, you start to understand. So how is anyone going to resist in a place like this? How is it possible? Because despite what Itka says, Jews were not just dehumanized objects. They were also active players. They did have agency. 
And yes, there was a drama that was unfolding, but what we're going to see from this story is that they actually had a choice. They could make a choice. And that's what Viktor Frankl says in Man's Search for Meaning. Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And I really think, and by the way, Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, we do have it excerpted in Echoes and Reflections, again, in the final solution lesson, um, unit rather. And this is a great quote because it applies just as much to us today as it did to people in Auschwitz 80 years ago. I mean, that's a much more extreme case, but in any situation, in any situation, when your students are frustrated by something, when something is happening in their lives, they always still have that choice to choose an attitude, to choose how they're going to behave and what, you know, wh how they will, will behave in that set of circumstances. So this is a very relevant type of quote. Of course, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, it's going to be a lot more extreme. So resistance in Auschwitz-Birkenau, let's get into the story. This is a story that's still shrouded in mystery. And why is it shrouded in mystery? Uh, because like many stories that you tell about Auschwitz, uh, many times there are not enough survivors. You don't know enough of the details. One person says this, one person says that. There are different versions. Um, it is still shrouded in mystery. It's a story that has been researched um, and, uh, and still, still, we don't know enough about all of the details. So this story is going to start in a factory called the Weichsel Union Metalwerke factory. Um, and this is the factory being built in 42, 43. This is a munitions factory. So we're going to call it the Union Factory. And it is a munitions factory. And because it was a munitions factory, um, there were people in it who had access to gunpowder, okay? And that will give you your first clue about how important this is going to be. Uh, at its height, there were probably about 3,000 people who worked in this factory. It's a big factory. Um, and they are creating, they are making munitions for the German army. Um, and uh, there is a group of women, three out of four of them, um, in this photo, worked in the factory. The only one who didn't is the one on the extreme right, Rosa or Ruja Robota, who worked in Canada, in Birkenau, and I will explain that um, in a couple of minutes. Um, there was a group of women who worked in the union factory, and what they did defies imagination, defies all the odds, is just unbelievable, boggles the mind. The choice that they made in their set of circumstances was that they were actually going to try, even though they knew it was hopeless, okay? They were going to try to somehow put a stop to this horrible Nazi machine of death that was in Auschwitz and in Birkenau. And how were they gonna do that? What they decided, what they came up with was that they were going to smuggle gunpowder, okay? They had access to it. They were gonna smuggle it. They were gonna pass it along um, and uh, hope that somebody could use it. So let me let me tell you a little bit about the people whose pictures you're looking at. And most of the testimony that we have comes from a woman named Anna Heilman. Anna Heilman is her name, was her name, um, after she got married, after she left Auschwitz. Um, she ultimately um, emigrated to Canada, and that was where she lived for most of her adult life. Um, but she started her life in Warsaw. Um, her family name was Weitzblum. And in the picture on the right, you can see her parents. Her parents were both deaf and dumb, which is very interesting also. Um, her father had a factory where he made all kinds of wooden, uh, wooden things. I believe that they were pretty well off. She had a nanny. You can see in the picture on the left, even just the way she's dressed with her sisters. So you're looking at uh, Anna would be on the left. She's the youngest sister. She was born with the name 
Hana or Hanka is what she was called affectionately. Her sister Sabina, who was the oldest sister, is in the middle of the picture. And on the right, you can see her sister Esther, whose nickname was Estusha. And Hana and Estusha will be the people that this story many times will focus on. So what happens is, um, and you can see also in this picture, this is a picture of a, uh, of, of a wedding in their family. And this is Hanka on, or Anna later on the bottom. And this is Esther or Estusha sitting right here. Sabina, the oldest sister is in the third row in the back. Um, and so what's gonna wind up happening and this is this is Anna when she gave her testimony to USC Shoah Foundation in 1996. We used a lot of this testimony for the podcast that I'm going to play you in a little while. Um, and she is the one from whom we get a lot of the details. Um, what what Anna tells us, and I'm, I'll use the name Anna from now on. What Anna tells us is that when she was younger, when she was in Warsaw, when the war started. Uh, she was a teenager. Um, but even before that, she had joined, and this is great pre-war stuff also, for those of you who are telling the story and using our pre-war Jewish life lesson, which is in unit number one, you always want to give a little bit of history. You always want to give some context. That's also one of our pedagogical principles. You want to understand the mindset of these people, where they were, what what's going on with them. Um, and What's happening with Anna and with her compatriots is that, you know, there's a lot of anti-Semitism in Poland before the war, before World War II, in that interwar period. There's also a lot of growing nationalism. And Poland is for the Poles, and uh, um, Jews are being kept out of, of sports organizations and schools, and they have to sit in the back of classrooms, and sometimes they can't you know, they can't be part of society, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Things get much worse when the Germans come, but there's still a great degree of anti-Semitism in that interwar period. And so what a lot of Jews are attracted to are these youth movements, youth movements. And we have a couple of really great testimonies about youth movements in that lesson plan. So just to let you know that it's there, if you haven't uh, taken a look, go kick the tires. Um, the youth movements were a chance for people like Anna, uh, who was a teenager, to kind of find herself among other Jews. And the, what they, their kind of raison d'etre, um, what they were going for, their goal, was to, um, to bring the Jews back to a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And that has a lot of political connotations these days, but this is where Zionism starts from, okay? Zionism as a political movement starts actually in the late 1800s. And so by 19, by the interwar period between 1918, 1933, 30, 39, um, you have this, these movements of Jews who are joining youth movements like the one in the picture that you see. And the one in the picture that you see is a very left-leaning movement. Um, many times Jews were attracted to left-leaning movements because communism and socialism are movements that say that internationally people shouldn't people are no different if you're a worker you're a worker if you're you know a member of the working class you have a lot more in common with other members of the working class than you know than a poll has with another poll that's not et cetera et cetera et cetera you understand where i'm going um so hannah was or anna was a member of one of these youth movements this is another great youth movement picture um the movement was called hashomer hatsair uh and again left-leaning very strong belief in Zionism, very strong belief in the Jewish homeland being in Palestine. And that is what she was attracted to. And that was even before the war started. Once the war starts, you know, in Warsaw, there's a ghetto that grows up in, the, in Warsaw. This is the largest ghetto that existed in occupied Europe during the war. Um, at the beginning, 30% of Warsaw's population was Jewish. Um, and that 30% of the population is going to be crushed into 2.4% of the area of the city. Um, the ghetto is a horrible, horrible place. At its height, there are almost half a million people living in the ghetto, starving in the ghetto, um, being treated very badly uh, by the Germans. And we know, of course, that 
<clears throat> there were really two uprisings in the Warsaw Ghetto, one in January of 1943 and the big one in April of 1943, where Jewish youth movements and fighters managed to hold off the Germans for a month, which was longer than even the Polish army was able to hold off the Germans. So Anna was a member of the youth movement. She was a member of the fighting the fighting element in the Warsaw Ghetto, she would run through the streets and plaster flyers on the walls of buildings calling for the Jews to fight back. Um, these are just pictures from the Warsaw Ghetto uprising that come actually from our video toolbox movie in the resistance unit. So if you haven't seen that one, take a look at that too. Um, it, uh, I think it came out pretty well. Um, and Anna, was she she managed to survive the Warsaw Ghetto uh, uprising and together with her family she was sent to Auschwitz in 1943 um when sorry first to Majdanek in Majdanek her parents perished um Sabina her older sister had uh, had run away to the Soviet Union so she was with Esther Anna and Esther were together and their relationship got even closer because they were together, because they lost their parents. After Majdanek, they were both sent to Auschwitz. And at Auschwitz, at Auschwitz, and here's a little preview of the uh, of the podcast, at Auschwitz, Anna says, you know, they were constantly, um, there was this group and Anna worked at the at the union factory with this group of women who was suffering together. They were walking back and forth for miles every day from Birkenau, which is where they slept, to the factory. Um, they were together all the time. They they made each other feel better. They were like sisters, okay? And they, they improved each other's morale. They told stories. And basically what Anna says is that she started telling the story, she and Esther started telling the story of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And no one had heard about it yet at Auschwitz because remember, they're behind lock and key. They're in a concentration slash death camp. Um, and she started telling these stories and it caught on. It, it Everybody was amazed that the Jews had fought back against the Germans. And so they started thinking to themselves, would it be possible to fight back against the Germans in a place like Auschwitz? And so Anna is telling all this. Um, and um, here is uh, the way the, um, the podcast appears. Uh, Teaspoons of Gunpowder, as you can see, it's podcast number four in the Human Spirit in the Holocaust podcast, which is intended for your students, right? Um, so you can use it. Uh, you can use it as homework. You can use it in class. It comes with a student reflection handout, as you can see, um, and also the transcript of the episode and lots and lots of photographs, some of which you've already seen. So um, I want to play you a little piece of a little piece of the podcast. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to jump around a little bit for a second. Hang on. Let me get out of here and into the podcast. Um, and again, you will see, of course, this is what the website looks like. And let me move this thing. And you'll see if you go into teach, you will see that the podcast appears right here on the left rail. And once you go into the podcast, again, you will see the, um, the page that I just showed you. And if you scroll down, you'll see we've got six podcasts total. Um, and we've got three new ones that went up on January 27th. So um, I'm going to play you, I have it set to play, I'm going to play you a tiny little piece of the podcast and try and show you some pictures while I'm playing it. Let's hope that I can do it. It's like chewing gum and walking at the same time. Um, so hopefully this will work out. The pictures that I'm showing you, some of them, and I just want to say there has been a movie that came out, you know, as, as, uh, as the podcast was being released, I was hearing about this movie. Um, it's called Sabotage, and it's basically about the same story. So there are some uh, stills that I've used from the movie there. It, it's partially animated, and you'll see them. Okay, so what you're hearing is a lot of testimony by Anna that we used in the podcast, and she's telling her story, and she's talking about this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press play and hope for the best. Ready? Back. 
The women took a huge risk by stealing gunpowder. The Germans weighed it, counted the fuses the women had to fill, and then tested those fuses to make sure they exploded. If production was off, or if the fuses didn't work, the Germans would know there was stealing going on. So the women had to sneak the gunpowder out invisibly, grain by grain, under the noses of their guards. In one day, three women could collect less than two teaspoons of gunpowder. It was also incredibly dangerous to smuggle the gunpowder out of the isolated gunpowder room, since every woman who worked there was searched. Estusha, whose workstation was next to the door of the room, collected the explosives but could not leave the room with them. So Anna came up with a creative strategy. I used to take two little metal boxes that were used for garbage and walk around as if I was, uh, you know, doing something. And eventually I used to take these two boxes to my sister. Uh, she used to put uh, a little bit uh, of uh, gunpowder wrapped up in a little rug tied with a string into a box and they uh, put garbage on the top box and I was walking with just two boxes from my place to her door and from her door back into my place and put it under the table and put it inside the cuff of my uh, dress. Other girls used other tricks. They secreted the gunpowder in pieces of paper or cloth, in pockets, hems, and even under their arms, on their bodies, or in their shoes. Often they were halted on the way back to their barracks at Birkenau, another part of Auschwitz, the threat of a search hanging constantly over them. Yet, fear did not stop them. Okay. On the way from the factory... That's just a little taste. Okay, just a little taste for you of what this uh, podcast sounds like. There's a lot of use of Anna Heilman's testimony, again, um, and the whole story is told there. So I hope that you're curious, and I hope that you will go and, uh, and listen to the entire thing. The great thing about these podcasts is that they're only 15 minutes long, maximum 16 minutes, give or take, um, and so your students can easily, easily use them. Uh, and you can use them in class. Okay, I want to introduce you to another very um, dominant personality that was part of this whole smuggling ring. And her name is Rosa, again, or Ruja, Robota. Rosa, we'll call her Rosa. Um, you can see her here. She was also in her, in the town in which she grew up, which was Chekhanov in Poland. She was also a member of the Shomer Hatsair. Um, youth movement, same reasons, because these youth movements were really into, again, Zionism, nationalism, social justice. Um, and what happens with Rosa, uh, and I want to show you another couple of pictures. Um, this is Rosa with her friends in Chekhanov before the war. You can see her in the back row there. Um, I want to show you this picture because it's very interesting. Um, these are her parents. Now, this picture is taken from the Chekhanov Yiskerbuch, a Yiskerbuch or Yisker book, remembrance book. Yisker is the, the Hebrew and also the Yiddish word for remembrance. Um, these are books that were written after the war by people from different cities who survived. So there's usually a Yisker book for different cities, for each different city. And in the Chekhanov Yisker book, there is this picture of Rosa Robota's parents. Now, Rosa had become a big, I mean, it was a big story. Um, and those who knew it after the war wrote it into the book. She was considered a real heroine. But when you see this picture, all that it says is in the caption, parents of Rosa Robota. And I just wanna make the point quickly that this, when you, when you see something like this, you're really looking at the landscape of the Holocaust because nobody knew their names. They had a picture, but no one after the war remembered what these people's names were. Everybody had been wiped out. Their entire family was wiped out. So that's you know one of the things that we do in Echoes and Reflections and one of the things that we do at Yad Vashem is we try and give these people back 
their faces and their names. In this case, only their faces because we don't know their names. So that's really a very typical story um, in the uh, in the Holocaust. Um, as I said, Rosa was a member of the Shomer Tzair youth group in Chekhanov. There she is. Um, and she was, she grew to be, uh, she was like a firebrand. She was a real, a real go-getter and she became um, one of the heads. So when she got to Auschwitz and she was taken to Auschwitz, um, if, if Anna got to Auschwitz, which I forgot to tell you, Anna got to Auschwitz when she was 16 years old. Um, and her sister Esther was about 20 years old. Then Rosa didn't get to, Rosa got to Auschwitz when she was either 21 or 23. We don't know for sure because we don't know exactly her birth date. When she got to Auschwitz, she uh, was recruited basically for the underground. And there was not one underground in Auschwitz, there were two, which also tells you that the prisoners in Auschwitz were constantly trying to do something to resist. Why was there an underground? Because the hope was that they could somehow improve their situation by sabotaging the German, the German war effort, by trying to break out of the camp, by doing, doing something that would alleviate all the misery that they were feeling. And Rosa was approached by some people in, uh, in the Jewish underground. Now, what's the difference between the two undergrounds? One underground was a very international underground. All of the prisoners, they came from everywhere. They weren't necessarily Jewish. There were a lot of non-Jewish prisoners at Auschwitz also. But there was also a Jewish underground, which was a strictly Jewish underground. And what's the difference between them? Why did there need to be two? Because the Jewish underground understood they were watching the genocide, the slaughter, the, you know, the, of, of millions of, not millions, but hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And we know the final tally is, about a million Jews who were murdered in Auschwitz. They were watching that happen. So unlike the international underground, which was made up a lot of a lot of non-Jews as well, they kind of were taking their time. And the Jewish underground knew that the longer they waited to, to act, the more Jews would be killed. And this is, was especially true with respect to one particular group, and that group that I'm talking about is the Zonderkommando. The Zonderkommando at Auschwitz, and this is a painting by David Olaire, who was a member of the Zonderkommando. Um, the Zonderkommando at Auschwitz, Primo Levi describes them, sorry. Primo Levi describes them as basically the most miserable of the miserable prisoners, because what their job is, um, and I we say this in the podcast since it's meant for students, we say it kind of very gingerly and uh, very vague, uh, vaguely. Um, what their job is basically is to shepherd the Jewish um, prisoners, or they're actually not prisoners because they don't even go through the camp. They're never absorbed by the camp. They just get off the train and they're immediately sent to the gas chambers where the Zonderkommando are the ones who bring them into the gas chambers tell them that they have to undress. Um, and then after, after they are gassed, the Zonderkommando prisoners are the ones who take the bodies, um, put them in the, in the ovens to be burned, pull the teeth, the gold teeth, cut the hair. It's a very grisly, grisly um, existence full of horror. Many of these people saw their own families. Um, so you understand the Zonderkommando every now and then, the Zonderkommando, many of them were killed and replaced by the Germans. Why? Because they were the Geheimnisträger, meaning the bearers of secrets. They knew too much about what was going on at Auschwitz-Birkenau. They knew all about the killing process. They were exposed to it. They had, you know, they, they, they saw the gas chambers. They saw them working. They saw the crematoria ovens working. By the way, the only thing that the Jews did not do in this whole factory of death was actually put in the Zyklon B. That's the gas that's used to kill, to murder all of the Jews in, um, in Birkenau. Um, that's the only part of the process that the Germans handled. Everything else was handled by the Jews. So these Zonderkommando were, again, the most miserable of the miserable. Here you see one of the pictures that was smuggled out of the camp where they're burning bodies outside. Um, when the um, 
when the crematoria weren't weren't working. And the Zonder commander decide that they need, because again, because groups of them are being killed all the time, they need to rise up. They need to um, rebel. They need to revolt against the Germans. And all of this is planned. And the members of the underground had turned to Rosa Robota, who worked in Canada. And let me just show you again. I promised to explain this to you. Um, this is gas chamber gas chamber and crematorium number four. And next to it is Canada. Canada was basically the storehouse where all of the possessions that were taken from the Jewish victims were kept. So it's like a huge, huge area of just warehouses where there were mounds of suitcases and mounds of blankets and mounds of, of, of clothing and shoes and anything that you can think of. Um, and Rosa worked, because she worked in Canada, in the Canada Commando, she was right next to gas chamber and crematoria number four. And she had access to the Zonder Commando who worked there. So ultimately, um, and ultimately when, when these women in Auschwitz were collecting gunpowder, and Anna tells you this in her testimony, what they did was they passed it to each other. They walked into Birkenau, with these little sacks of gunpowder. And then at Birkenau, once they got to Birkenau, they somehow passed it to Rosa, who passed it to the Zonderkommando. And with this gunpowder, the Zonderkommando was actually able to make more than 100 primitive grenades. We'll call them grenades. They were basically food tins that were stuffed with shards of glass, and they had wicks that had been saturated in the gunpowder that was brought from the factory. Um, on October 7th, 1944, the one and only uprising that ever occurred at Auschwitz occurred, it was done by the Zonderkommando with the uh, dynamite, with the gu gunpowder that was smuggled into the camp. It started in crematoria number four and spread also to crematoria number two. Um, I will not go into too much detail about the Zonderkommando uprising, except to say that um, although it was a huge and brave and heroic act, um, by the end of it, pretty much hundreds of Zonderkommando were just wiped out. They were murdered by the, by the uh, Germans who came with machine guns and just mowed everyone down. So there were very few people who witnessed it who were actually left to talk about it. And what happens now is once the Zonderkommando uprising happens, the Germans are aware, they become aware that there was gunpowder that was used and they start to track it. Where did this gunpowder come from? And their search, their investigation leads them to the other women who you saw in that first picture. This is Ala Gartner from Benjin. Um, uh, and um, this is Re Regina or Regina Safferstein from um uh, and you can see one of the really interesting things, again, this is, again, uh, um, to kind of make the, the Holocaust real for you. No, there was no picture of her available for years and years and years and years and years until some of the researchers reached out to people from her fa distant family that might have something. And then this, this, um, this picture was found where the family is gathering to celebrate the marriage of one of Regina's relatives uh, who had immigrated to the United States. Um, so Regina and Alla and Esther, uh, who was a big part of the smuggling operation, as you know, because she worked again, she worked in the dynamite room. So did Regina. Alla worked in the, um, in the office of the factory and Rosa working in Canada. These are the four people who were found by the Germans for sure. What happens is the Germans um, track them down and they take Esther and Regina in for questioning. Um, they're beaten up, terribly tortured, but they don't reveal anything. And so they're sent back to their barracks and everyone is breathing a sigh of relief because maybe they won't be caught after all. But what winds up happening is that they are picked up again together with Ala Gartner and Rosa um, the four women are tortured, tortured, tortured beyond any comprehension, um, and then they are sentenced to death. Uh, and 
two stories that I want to tell you in this capacity. Um, this is a quote. Yaakov Kozalchik was the Jewish capo of, of Block 11 in Auschwitz, which was the torture bunk, um, torture bunker, barrack. And he actually, at great personal risk, um, and don't read ahead, but at great personal risk, he managed to smuggle into the barrack um, a man named Noach Zabludovich, who had been in the youth movement with Rosa Robota in Chekhanov, in their, their city where they grew up. And um, in order to do this, he got the German guard very, very drunk. And then he allowed Noach to go into the bunker. And Noach uh, wrote this description of what he saw. He says, I entered Rosa's cell on the cold cement lay a figure like a heap of rags. At the sound of the door opening, she turned her face to me. Then she spoke her last words. She told me that she had not betrayed anyone. She wished to tell her comrades that they had nothing to fear. We must carry on. It was easier for her to die knowing that our actions would continue. It was a pity to lose one's life and have to leave this world but she did not regret her actions. She was not sorry that it was her lot to die. I received from her a note for the comrades outside. It was signed with the exhortation, Chazak ve'ematz, be strong and of good courage. That's Hebrew. The time came to leave and I left the bunker. This was the last time I saw Rosa face to face, but I will never forget her. So she had been tortured to such an extent that she was just lying on the cement like a heap of rags. And I think it's a, it's really an incredible, an incredible picture that you get. What she was worried about, what she wanted to tell him was that she had not betrayed anyone because she knew a lot of the people in the underground. We still don't know all of the women who were in this chain of smuggling, but Rosa did know a lot of the people. And she wanted to tell Noah that she did not betray anyone, that she had not given up anybody's name. And there is another thing that Kozalchik also did. He sent, he passed a letter from Esther, who similarly had been terribly tortured to her sister, Hannah or Anna, uh, Anna Heilman. And Esther wrote, I can hear the sounds of the prisoner's footsteps above my head, the familiar sounds of the camp, the capo's shouts, the calls to tea, bread, soup, all those familiar sounds that I once hated so much. And now, because they will be lost very soon, sound so very dear to me. For those outside my window, there is still hope, but for me, there is nothing. For me, all is lost. The good, happy news of imminent salvation is not meant for me. The tea and the roll call are not for me. All is lost and I so very much want to live. This is a 20 year old girl, beautiful girl. Um, she also passed a note and Kozalczyk got it to her friend, Marta, to Hanka's friend, Marta, to basically take good care of Anna. And this here you see Marta and Anna after the war. Um, we know from testimonies, and I'm, I'm going to close uh, in another minute, so leave a little bit of time for questions. We know from testimonies that there were at least 26, we have 26 names of women who were involved in the chain of smuggling this gunpowder. We have the people who worked in the Pulveraum, the gunpowder room, um, who were searched before they could leave it. Uh, and so they passed their gunpowder to other people who put it into those little bags and into the sacks and carried in, under their arms or in their shoes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as you heard Anna say. Um, but there were probably many more than that. So there were at least 30, at least 30 women who took part in this. Most of them were between 16 and 23 years old. It's the real rarity, like Regina Saperstein, she was a little bit older. Uh, I think she was about 30. Um, but most of them were between 26, 16 and 23 rather. And they did this smuggling over a period of at least seven months. It could have been more than that because they were able to smuggle so, so little grain by grain. They did this so little gunpowder. Um, and uh, ultimately all four of the women that I showed you were hung. They were hung on January 5th and 6th. One, two, sorry, in front of the night shift and two in front of the day shift at the factory um, in order to send a message to all of the other prisoners that they better not be trying to sabotage. This was the last hanging execution in Auschwitz and it was done less than two weeks 
before the camp was evacuated and less than three weeks before the Russian army came on January 27th, 1945 and liberated Auschwitz. Um, and I wanna just read you one more little piece here from uh, a woman who describes what she saw. In the faint light of dawn, the silhouette of the gallows appeared against the backdrop of the sky. A light burned above the gallows. And from the central column, we saw two ropes hanging down. On the platform, the camp commandant Hessler sat in all his glory along, along with the giant prisoner hangman Kozalchik. The sudden movement caused the assembled prisoners to retreat backwards to make way for the victims. Two Polish Jewish women, barely 20 years of age, they, marked, they marched calmly and resolutely. The two Polish women presented their delicate necks to the hangman. The man, he too was Polish, overcame his nervousness and abhorrence and pulled the rope tight and two silhouettes that appeared like tragic marionettes swayed back and forth in the air. Two silhouettes with drooping heads spinning slowly around themselves in half circles, their arms dangling against the night sky dotted with stars. That was the end of these four brave women again, two in the morning and two were um, executed in the evening. Um, and I'm gonna close with this with this uh, quote from Guta Blau, who is also a woman who took part in the smuggling, who says, helpless and without any hope, we decided to stop this machine of destruction. So we organized a group of young girls who were willing to sacrifice their lives for this noble purpose, to stop or slow down the machinery of death as much as possible. Um, so in closing, yeah, watch for additional programs on the website and the prepare section. And I'm gonna keep this up for a second. If you don't mind um, taking our very short webinar satisfaction survey, we take your uh, input and your feedback very seriously. So take a quick picture of the QR code and I will stop sharing my screen so that I can check into the chat box and see what's going on in there and if any of you have questions. Um, I mean, what I want you to take from this is really how unbelievable these women were, how heroic they were, um, and how resistance was something that these women did decide to do. Nobody made them do it. This was a choice that they had. Um, and they really were, really were very amazing. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trolling in the chat box for any, uh, for any, um, for any questions that you have. Um, and so far I'm not seeing any questions. So if you do, yeah, I see Leslie, you're reading Shlomo Venezia's book. Um, the, the Zonder Commando stuff is very, very hard to read. I see Robin had a question. Is it true that Greek Jews who could not speak Yiddish and thus could not communicate with their fellow Jews were specifically chosen for the Zonderkommando. Um, I don't know that that was why many Greek Jews were chosen. And by the way, it wasn't only Greek Jews. It wasn't all Greek Jews. Uh, there were Polish Jews. There were other, there were people from other countries. There were a lot of Greeks. Um, but, you know, the Zonderkommando were kept separate from the other prisoners. So the language thing, I don't know if that was really the reason why they were chosen. They were, many of the Greek Jews were chosen because they were healthy. Um, they were, a lot of them were, um, were kind of like longshoremen. Uh, and so they were very physically, um, physically strong, which you had to be to, to do this work. Uh, I see that Tiffany had a question. Did any of the members of the resistance devise a code to pass along information to others? Um, don't know. Don't know. Um, I would, uh, that would, that would be very interesting. I mean, yeah, there must have been ways that the underground recognized each other. So, uh, but I think that it was also kind of hand um, or mouth to ear to mouth. And there's a better way to say that. That's, uh, um, yeah. How can we get more information on these, on these women? <clears throat> you can read about them. First of all, listen to the podcast. Um, listen to the podcast, you will hear the entire story told in a much briefer way and a much simpler way, because again, this is a podcast that's aimed at students. Um, so uh, listen to the podcast. And then, you know, the more you read, the more you read, you'll, you'll find it. If you look up any of their names on the internet, 
um, either Anna Heilman, she has a two hour, two hour plus testimony in eyewitness. If you want to listen to the old, the whole thing, um, you, uh, you could look up Rosa Robota, who there's a lot that's been written about her. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, they were, the Greeks were, Veronica, I see is saying that the Greeks were discriminated against by their fellow Jews, which is also very interesting. Um, very, very interesting. Um, one of the things about Greek Jews was that many of this, so many of them were murdered uh, just because they could not speak Yiddish and also because they were not used to the climate of Poland. Um, the fact that they couldn't speak Yiddish put them at a huge disadvantage. And that's what I think what, what is being referred to here, that they were discriminated against uh, because they were kind of these odd ducks. You know, most of the European Jews spoke Yiddish and here were these Greek Jews who didn't. Um, I see a question, where are we able to watch Sabotage? Honestly, I don't know. It's been in film festivals. I know it was in the Miami Film Festival not long ago, uh, a month or two ago. So look for it in film festivals. It's not available yet. The pictures that I took were from the trailer, which you can find on the internet. Um, and will the PowerPoint be shared with you? If you go into the webinar recording, you will find the PowerPoint there. You'll find the whole recording of this. Um, the PowerPoint will actually, I'm sorry, but will not be shared. Um, we don't usually share PowerPoints after webinars, but the recording is there. So if you want to take pictures of anything, um, I'm very happy that we, that I was able to share out, to share these stories with you, Tiffany. May we all be so brave as to carry out our gunpowder with a teaspoon when called upon. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Um, and yes, the systematic dehumanization uh, and um, and the the incredible fact that resistance was possible and did occur at Auschwitz. So I will leave you with that. Um, thank you all. Um, thank you all for being here tonight, today, um, and uh, hope to see you on another webinar.